Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. I'm Dr. Jara Warner green Folks call me Dr. NG because it's a little bit easier. And I'm here with a couple of our wonderful master's students today, Cameron Reinhardt and Jaylee Norsuche. And so they're going to uh, be helping me present our conceptual framework today. Oh, and we're from The Ohio State University. The B is very important. Okay, so um, most of us in the room are probably very familiar um, that hunger and food security is continuing to be a very wicked problem um, that we are dealing with um, across the globe. Um, and so when we are starting to think about how we're addressing these in our communities and in these projects that we're working on, um, we have to recognize that food systems are very complex systems. Um, they are considered socio-ecological systems and comprise of all of these activities along the food chain um, from those that are producers all the way to uh, those who are consumers. And so um, a good food system is considered one that's just and equitable, um, with access for everyone, um, and that is going to respect natural resources, animals, and those that are all part of that food system. That's a, a challenging task to, um, to engage in. And so as we're kind of thinking about um, the work that we're wanting to do with communities, we wanted to see, well, what are some of these concepts that we have been working with, some of these approaches that we can start to incorporate to build a framework that can guide us in some of this work that we're doing, whether that is through our research or maybe it is through just engaging in practices with groups to uh, address issues within their food systems. Um, so really the purpose of this was to create a conceptual framework um, to help to create some guidelines for food systems issues. We wanted to incorporate systems thinking and also another approach that um, we use a lot is adaptive leadership and we use that um, in some of the work that we do as well as our teaching. And so um, the inspiration actually came from a dietetics framework um, that I found. Um, and so they were uh, putting together how to address um, uh, some of these issues within dietetics in communities. And so their first phase was to assess the, so the social determinants of health um, and then to form formulate and implement solutions and then to come around on the back end and continue to evaluate those impacts. And then that was a circular loop that included systems thinking as part of that entire process. So I really appreciated how these dietitians went and looked at this much broader perspective of how to engage healthy lifestyles and eating um, and, and, and everything from sustainability to food waste. So what we wanted to do was to try to think about you know, how can we bring in systems thinking a little bit more of the focus of our framework as well as include adaptive leadership. Um, and so that is an approach, and we'll tell you a little bit about you know, what we've found in the context of, of food and natural resources. Um, but adaptive leadership was kind of mentioned in their framework, but not a central focus. So being a leadership person, I said, let's bring that to the forefront a little bit more. Um, and so we wanted to really kind of start thinking about how we could develop this framework and begin utilizing it to address issues related to the food system. And in particular, uh, Dr. Rodriguez and my work focuses on food security, household nutrition and resiliency, and subsistence farming. So of course there are much other issues related to food systems, but that has primarily been the context in which we have worked. So thinking about this in both research and practice. Um, so this is really kind of our first step in kind of developing some of our future uh, work. Um, and so I am going to pass this over so that um, Jacqueline can tell you a little bit more about systems thinking um, and some of these foundations that informed our framework. Hello everyone. As Dr. Angie mentioned, I'm going to guide you through a uh, systems thinking theory, definitions, and some applications of this important theory. Well, first, did you know that systems thinking theory dates back to Aristotle time? So since we, we are in Greece, that's an important fact to know. And well, why? Because he started thinking about this holistic approach and how the whole was more than just the sum of the parts. So we can define systems uh, as more of the collective sum of the parts and also uh, it has elements, interconnections, purpose and behaviors. How can we define systems thinking theory? This is defined as a set of skills that we use to improve the way that we understand how systems in general work in different areas. 
And also, uh, these can be used to address different uh, problems or issues, not just in, in theoretical areas, but also these can be applied in natural resources. Well, here I have some examples of how can we apply systems thinking theory in natural resources that is or area of expertise. And first, I have the example of a food security and fisheries in Philippines. Here, uh, researchers uh, identify different, uh, different threats to food security, and also they investigate the different drivers that were moving these uh, these factors, and these were ecological, socioeconomical, and different other factors. And also, we have an example in Ghana with agribusiness sustainability, where they could also identify these factors, and also uh, they could improve the business survival in this region. And finally, we have a, an application in tourist industry in Vietnam, where this was in a, in a specific reserve there, and. After three years of investigating, they could involve different stakeholders and they could improve the economical situation in this region and it's one of the most notable projects back then. So now, Cameron is going to explain you and guide you through the definitions of adaptive leadership and some application. Thank you everyone, thank you Jaylene. So adaptive leadership really is the practice of mobilizing people to tackle tough challenges. That's what Heifetz has explained to us. And there's other definitions out there from North House and other researchers who have been prominent in this field. But there's some major things to consider when applying adaptive leadership. It's definitely not easy to do. Leaders struggle with adaptive leadership as Heifetz and Linksy explained to us. But there are applications that leaders can take to get over some of those barriers. So authority is one of those major things. So recognizing, do you have formal or informal authority? Formal authority coming with the actual title that you have to make decisions for whether it's an organization or a company or another entity that you're involved in. And the informal authority, you're able to have the influence of those around you to implement leadership and implement change. And then looking at the types of problems. Is this a technical problem or is it an adaptive challenge? A technical problem being one that can be solved by those people who have authority within that entity that you're working in. But an adaptive challenge is even more complex. There's multiple barriers that might be there that are going to prevent some challenges along the way. It takes learning to get through that process. As does adaptive leadership as a whole, you learn through the entire process to get to your end result. And then looking at the values, so what does it mean to have espoused values versus actual behaviors? Are the values that your organization, business, or other entity actually being shown through the actions that you're taking? So people can say that they believe or have value in something, but then they don't have the actions to back up what they're saying. So it needs to make sure that they're actual espoused. And then competing commitments, speaking the unspeakable, and work avoidance also play into this entire process of adaptive leadership, making sure that we aren't putting challenges in front of us, but really thinking ahead and thinking about how can we get through those tough challenges by working together and learning through the entire process. So there's really three major steps in order to implement adaptive leadership correctly, no matter what that challenge is that you or your organization might be facing. So that's creating holding environments, applying the concept, and then getting on the balcony. So creating holding environments is a space formed of networks and relationships within which people can tackle tough, sometimes diverse questions, such as these barriers within food systems issues or other complex topics like diversity and inclusion, whatever that might be that your organization or that you are working with, you have to create those holding environments to bring in other experts and really think deeply about that topic. Applying the concept is observing an integrated group dynamic. So what are the other people around you doing? How can we work together? How can we collaborate? And really how can we come together to apply this concept and stimulate adaptive learning. Because again, to tackle that tough challenge, you have to be willing to learn and open your minds to new things. 
and then getting on the balcony. So stepping outside of the situation and obtaining a greater perspective of what is happening. And Um, so we do have some chat. We do have some examples, and we'll be happy to send those out to you. Um, but there are um, there is a gap in the literature when it comes to food systems and natural resources and agriculture uh, when it comes to applying adaptive leadership. Two articles that we found: one focused in Florida, how the conservation districts apply adaptive principles to their studies, which led to new conservation practices being implemented in the state of Florida, and then another looking at data within agricultural systems and financial s sustainability and how adaptive leadership and adaptive principles helped increase the sustainability on the financial aspects within the agricultural industry. Uh, again, the, but some of this data is more available in fields such as the medical field and the education industry. But now I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. NG to talk about our framework. Thank you, Cameron. So I love finding gaps in the literature. That's <laughs> where the innovation can occur. So when we were searching all of these databases uh, for looking at how systems thinking has been applied in research in agriculture and natural resources, the environment, and adaptive leadership, and that database after database resulted in very few results, I got excited. <laughs> because that's going to give us the opportunity to contribute in that way. So we're really taking a couple of these approaches and being able to apply it in the context in which we are going to work. So this is kind of how we put it together. And again, I really looked at those phases that the dietetics, the dietitians used for their framework, and we felt like the three phases still worked really well. So identify what these influential factors are um, to the food system, the food system in the context in which we are working, formulating solutions with the group we're working with, so whether that is going to be extension professionals, hopefully this is, we're taking this adaptive leadership approach, community members and other participants, it should be more broad. Um, and then evaluating those impacts. So a little bit more in depth here, um, with a systems thinking approach, we're wanting to look at social, political, economic, and cultural factors that influence food systems. So instead of this being just a technical problem that someone with expertise or formal authority can come in and say, hey, here's your answer, we've got to recognize that there are going to be various factors that are going to influence it. Social dynamics. What is the history of this community? Who is it that holds the power? And so that is part of that identification of the issue where we can engage in that systems thinking, um, hopefully with people that are bringing different perspectives and not just those that are in withholding formal authority. Um, so there are some tools that you can use um, to engage in systems thinking. It's, it's a philosophy, it's a way of thinking, and there's also the, um, the, the skill building that can go along with that too. So we just kind of listed some of these approaches that you can use with your groups. So in phase two, developing strategies. Um, so helping to increase sustainable and transformative effects with multidisciplinary collaborations. So again, really wanting to focus on bringing in different um, areas of expertise as well as perspectives to look at how we can actually develop strategies to improve the food system. And then finally too, evaluating you know, the potential of these proposed solutions. And still going with that systems approach, we need to do evaluation at different levels. So looking at the household, looking at the community, policy, and population. Um, so this is a longer term endeavor. This is not just coming in and just doing a project and leaving. This is about establishing relationships. And then I have adaptive leadership as kind of occurring throughout. So adaptive leadership, one of the um, perspectives that informs it is a systems perspective. So it tends to dovetail really nicely with using systems thinking as an approach. And so that helps to inform the behaviors of extension professionals, researchers, those that are coming in so that you are continuing to, to um, include various perspectives, get on the balcony, um, continue to think about the complexity of the problem and those um, other behaviors that Cameron shared with you. So why is this important? We can use this to help develop programming, outreach efforts and solutions. Um, we need to continue to engage in bold and transformational um, approaches. We've got to continue to think outside the box, right? 
Um, and then this will kind of helps challenge some of those traditional development efforts um, and help us face um, some of those complex um, issues a little bit differently. Okay. And I have to stop. So. We'll give you a minute. Okay, thank you. All right, this is my last slide. I know you're doing a great job, thank you. <laughs> Um, so, as I said, this is kind of our first step. We wanted to go into the literature, see what we could find, start pulling together ideas. And so our next step is to start working probably first locally in Ohio with our community development extension professionals um, and working with some of their communities to address some of their food systems issues. And we will be engaging in mixed methods research because I think there is both quantitative and qualitative data that's going to be important um, to uh, learning about how people are engaging in this problem solving and how well this approach is actually working. Um, and so then we would like to try to extend that um, to work with other populations after we've kind of tested this model a bit. So, thank you. So we're going to enter five minutes of discussion, and as the discussant, I'm going to get us started with the question so that you can formulate several, I hope, to ask them. So um, when I read your, your abstract that's in the proceedings, the question that I had at the end, um, you mentioned that this framework challenges traditional development efforts. And so I wondered if you could expand a little bit on that innovative approach. Um, so oftentimes we sometimes will focus on like a symptom and so looking at one particular problem um, and also when we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the PD session about the limitations of funding as well it's like okay we're going to go in we're developing a program our evaluation is going to check some of these boxes we're counting how many people were there how many women were there how many youth were there how many uh, men were there um, and then that's kind of the end. So we're really trying to push back against that, looking at how can we engage in a longer term relationship, really start to understand some of those broader um, influencers, like the political, the economic, the historical, um, looking at those social dynamics, and keeping that at the center of the process throughout. Um, and so I feel like just from our you know, literature review, we found that there is that gap there in applying it in some of our contexts. Um, and so we hope that this is a way that we can kind of bring in, we see some more systems thinking, um, just like you see adaptive leadership in medical and education fields, we see systems thinking a lot more in hard sciences. Um, and so trying to bring it a little bit more into the development context. And then as you, as you get the question, go right here. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that. And I wanted to go along with this question uh, as, a, as a STEM I don't know what I represent STEM a little bit here at this yeah. conference. We have competing models of reality mm -hmm. in science. It blows grad students' minds that we do. So on the social science side, how do you select the right partnerships with all of those competing conceptual models out there for how to proceed technically with development? That is a great question. And I don't know if y'all were able to see his in the room. So Katrina, what's your last name? Oh, Alford. Alford. Katrina Alford. Her dissertation research actually was focusing on looking at hard and soft systems thinking. And if, so if you can hunt her down, because I think that that's a great contribution because it's looking at those different paradigms and how some people with hard systems thinking are really thinking about, okay, how can I build a model to predict what's gonna happen and this is the answer. And those that are engaging, I'm more on the soft systems thinking side, so I'm like thinking about relationships and more conceptual. Well, if I get with a hard systems thinking person, we're probably gonna have a little bit of difficulty starting to speak the same language. Um, so I think first it's about talking about approaches to problem solving. Um, how they are conceptualizing, because this is something that we also deal with in social science, is getting, you know, the hard science folks to be like, we really do bring value, because, you know, what, what these innovations and these developments are actually going to help people, and the people are going to either adopt them or not. They might reject them. What kind of um, implications does this have for, like, the power dynamics in a community? Um, so I think it's first having some of those initial conversations, and trying to determine what paradigms we're first operating in um, and then start to kind of map out how we can 
collaborate in some effective ways. And you might find that someone is just not going to be a good partner in that. I think we have time for one more. Yes. Um, so as it relates to this framework that you created, do you see um, an opportunity as the researchers entering into the issue to be able to, through this framework, identify and handing off, like identifying a point in which you can hand off the project, the solution, or sustainability at that local level? Thank you. Um, so she asked if there's a point where we could see handing it off, and that would be ideal, which is why at the beginning of the process, making sure that you've got a variety of people at the table, that it's not just folks that are you know, in charge, that have formal positions, but that you've got other people that are engaging in that process and starting to learn, or start, starting to think using the system's thinking because at the end of the day, we know if we are addressing a local food systems issue, it's, it's going to only be solved or improved by folks at that local level. I mean, we have to understand that as an outsider, you know, we, nor is it necessarily our place to be like, oh, here's a solution. That's why oftentimes, you know, things fail. Very good. Thank you. We're out of time for questions.